Welcome again to Landmarks of Prophecy. I'd like to welcome our local audience here in Albuquerque, to New Mexico, to a very special program today. And also our friends joining us in the various churches and the downlink sites across the country and around the world, a very special welcome to you. Thank you for being part of this international Bible study. Now the lesson today is a very important one, beginning right to the very heart of our study of the book of Revelation. It's entitled, Bowing to the Beast. Well, who is the beast? What does it mean to worship the beast? You know, the most fearful warning that you can find anywhere in Scripture is found in Revelation chapter 14. It's a, wor it's a warning not to worship the beast or his image. Well, we're going to study that subject today. So I hope you all have your lessons with you to follow along. And those joining us online, you can download the lesson at landmarksofprophecy.com. And you can follow along with us as we study together. Now we have a theme song that we've been singing through the series, actually written by Pastor Doug Batchelor, entitled Power in the Pages. So I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward and also our song leaders. And let's stand as we sing our theme song together, Power in the Pages. bow our heads and have a word of prayer as we begin our service. Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for this time that we have now to come together with freedom to study your word in this group and to be able to broadcast the truth into many countries. We pray, Lord, for the presence of your spirit in all that is said and done here, the words that we sing, the words that are spoken, the questions that are answered. We pray that truth will be proclaimed, that hearts will be touched and lives changed. We thank you and ask that you're glorified in all of this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, God bless. You may be seated. And we're going to invite Dr. David DeRose to come out now and to share once again. He has a, a Bible nugget and important spiritual truth as well. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm glad my vision is impaired. 
Really, really. I, I'm glad I cannot see so well that I could see all the bacteria and fungi and viruses that are all around us. Really, it would be frightening. Are you aware that in our own guts, that's right, your own intestines, there are germs that if they got into your bloodstream, they could kill you? Well, in our previous presentation, we were talking about a virus that some people think we don't need to worry about, but I believe it is still something that should be front and center in our minds. It's the Ebola virus. It's still sweeping West Africa, and although there are signs that they're making some progress in places like Monrovia, Liberia, the rural areas and surrounding countries are being affected, as we pointed out in a previous presentation, with the country of Mali now having serious concerns about an outbreak having crossed its borders. With that in mind, I'm arguing for people today that wherever we live, we should be living an Ebola-aware lifestyle. What I mean by this is even if we were to take Ebola out of the question, we should be living an infectious disease-aware lifestyle. I make this point for a simple reason, and that is we can make a huge difference in whether we contract illness if we keep our immune system strong and if we pay attention to a subject that we'll look at shortly. The subject is hygiene. Hygiene. Some of you may realize there's often a connection between the physical and the spiritual. How many of you remember a previous presentation of Pastor Doug's speaking about the importance of baptism? I have to tell you a true story because it happened not all that long ago. I was actually eating at the table with someone. Actually, they were the guests, if you will, at my table. So, uh, you know, it changes the scenario a little bit. You need to understand that context. And this individual was somewhat mentally challenged, we won't say because of their age of development or what the situation was. And uh, I realized this person hadn't been able to follow our cues for hygiene prior to sitting at the table. So I offered them some of that nice uh, sanitizing gel with alcohol. And the person uh, kind of had an unusual response. And I said, do you know why I'm offering this to you? And they said, because you think I'm dirty. And, uh, well, I, that was an interesting response. I explained to them, well, we're actually all dirty. And that's why we try to make sure we're clean when we sit at the table and we eat our food. Well, it's really the same dynamic we talked about in the subject of baptism, isn't it? Many people think, well, I'm fine just the way I am. Doesn't Jesus accept me just as I am? It's true, he accepts you just the way you are, but he doesn't leave you that way. And he asks us to go through steps spiritually for our benefit. Baptism is one of them. And we'll see that when it comes to a public health perspective, in a world of infectious diseases, there is also a special place for cleanliness, we won't go so far as to say we have to baptize ourselves before we eat, but surely sprinkling is not enough in that context either. Well, let me tell you why I'm so concerned about this in the context of the Ebola virus. Hygiene is so important because one of the big issues that determines whether or not you become infected with an organism is called the infective dose. Infective dose, it's a very interesting concept. Some of you, no doubt, have been affected with a germ called Campylobacter. You say, Campylobacter? I never heard about it. Well, you've probably been infected because if you ever had food poisoning, the odds are that you were affected either by Salmonella or Campylobacter. These two bacterial illnesses affect, between the two of them, some three to four million Americans every year. But I want you to notice something. Campylobacter, which is transmitted orally, you have to ingest somewhere between 500 and 10,000 Campylobacter bacteria. This actually is making a very important point for hygiene. Think about it. You may have been exposed to Campylobacter, it may be on your hands, but if you wash your hands thoroughly, you may only ingest 25 bacteria. Now, I know that may not sound all that comforting, that you just, you know, you know ate a pathogenic bacteria. 
but your immune system is strong enough under such a small onslaught to fight off the bacteria. Do you see how that works? Now, some of you have heard of the disease typhoid fever. The infective dose for typhoid fever is actually much smaller. And some of you are wondering why there's a range. Why for typhoid fever is it 15 to 1,000? Who would it take 15 to infect and who would it take 1,000? Presumably because of other host factors. How strong your immune system is, for example. How much acid is in your stomach? By the way, those of you that are taking acid-blocking drugs for digestive problems or reflux, you're at higher risk of contracting infectious agents orally because you don't have the acid to cut down on that bacterial load. You see how that works. With that in mind, we come to the subject of our special focus over these last few presentations, and that is the Ebola virus. When it comes to the Ebola virus, you'll notice that with aerosolized models, now this is very interesting, in the laboratory they've actually put Ebola into the air and they've shown that they can infect non-human primates with as little as 1 to 10 bacteria. Interesting, isn't it? Well, the point is, we want to practice hygiene to decrease the exposure that we might have to infectious illnesses. You say Campylobacter, sure. Typhoid fever, sure. But Ebola, am I really going to be exposed to it? And how likely is that to happen? How would I become exposed? Most of you have heard uh, so far on the news many things that are correct. Ebola is most likely to be transmitted in people with serious clinical illness, people who are showing symptoms of the disease, often with fever, although we pointed out previously some 10% of those or more with Ebola infection, active infection that can be transmitted do not have a fever. They often have diarrhea, vomiting, and other things. All those body fluids are extremely infectious. And once you are exposed to the virus, there's a range of up to 21 days. Some people say more, potentially, in a minority of cases, where you can come down with the clinical illness. You say, okay, well, we've heard all that. This graphic here might be helpful. It actually shows you how unlikely you are to contract the disease for someone who has not yet been diagnosed. Very low virus levels before clinical symptoms start. Within a few days, those viral levels have increased a thousandfold and then 10,000-fold by the time you actually have four or five days of clinical illness behind you. Okay, so you say, fair enough. I'm not around anybody who's really sick. Is it sa am I safe then? Can I be sure I won't be exposed to Ebola? Let me show you a slide that is a very sobering slide in the public health community. Individuals who've been ex exposed to uh, Ebola and have then come down with a clinical illness can continue to have virus particles in their bodily secretions. In the case you can see of the most extreme body fluid, that's semen, over three months you can have persistence of the virus in that body fluid. The point is, there still may be some possibility of contagion even after a person is free of the disease. What about airborne transmission? Although this has been downplayed in the uh, literature and the lay press, the medical literature says this is possible. It is possible that uh, aerosol transmission could occur. And then when it comes to animals and Ebola, we know that dogs, among other animals, actually can be infected with Ebola and apparently not become clinically ill. So there's a number of things that could perpetuate Ebola in a community. You say, okay, this is just making us more afraid, Dr. DeRose. Well, let me tell you one other thing. Fomites, inanimate objects, can also transmit Ebola. This has been demonstrated with blankets in the research, whereas in other studies it's not looked like a very efficient way to transmit it. There are cases where fomites have transmitted it. Well, what does this all do for us? It's, does it just make us say, let's go hide under our beds, and until everything is, is finished with Ebola in the world, uh, you know, then we can come out. No, the point is we can practice hygienic practices. If I am exposed, if Ebola is rampant in Albuquerque, it's not yet, there's no uh, Ebola in Albuquerque to my knowledge right now, but if it did come to this community, yes, there might be a risk of touching a doorknob if pe there's many people with active infection. Wash your hands. By the way, if you do that, you're going to decrease your risk of the flu as well. Be careful in the bathroom that after you've washed your hands, you open the door with a clean towel. Simple things like this. When you're eating, take a clean plate every time you serve yourself because 
oral secretions can have Ebola and can be transmitted from person to person. This may sound like a burden, but God gives instruction, whether in the spiritual realm about baptism, because he's wanting to complete his work in us of cleansing. Whether it's infectious diseases, practice hygiene, and you'll experience God's blessing in decreased risk of infectious disease. Well, it's time for questions and answers right now. Pastor Doug and John Ross are coming out to answer those questions that you've been submitting. Thank you very much, Dr. Rose. Some good practical information there. Welcome again, friends. Good to see you and want to thank those who have been sending in their Bible questions. If you have any Bible questions, just send them in to landmarksofprophecy.com. And it's uh, fun getting them from literally all over the world. So Pastor yeah, Ross, right. what are we Well, have? we're ready to go. We got, uh, we're going to get to as many questions as we can this morning. So the first one is, will babies and young children be resurrected when Jesus comes? Yes. It tells us for a couple of verses... Uh, one is in Jeremiah 31, 16. It talks about uh, saving our children. The Lord will bring them back from the land of the enemy. Uh, uh, the devil is the author of death, and that is certainly the land of the enemy. Uh, secondly, you read in Malachi chapter 4, it says, they shall go, speaking of the redeemed, they shall go forth and grow up. And so evidently, in order for someone to grow up in heaven, they need to be young when they're resurrected. And so we certainly know that the, uh, the children in particular of the redeemed are all going to be raised and there'll be a lot of wonderful reunions of parents that have had their children torn away by death being placed in their arms by angels. Okay, the next question that we have, what is God the Father's true name and is it important for us to use it? Yeah, you know, there's a... There's a very sincere group of people in the Christian church that are, uh, feel very strongly that we need to use the Hebrew pronunciation of God's name and Jesus' name when we address him. Uh, I respectfully disagree. Um, first of all, when you talk about what is the right name for God, there are many names that God uses to identify himself. The Lord is like a facet of a diamond with a thousand sides, and each name shares some facet of God's character. He's called the El Shaddai, Elohim, Yahweh, uh, the All-Sufficient One, Jesus, who is God, the Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Alpha, the Omega, the Door, the Lamb, the Water, I mean, many names. Um, is God requiring us to speak another language when we address Him? When Jesus was on the cross, he says in Mark chapter 16, he cried from the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And they didn't know what he was saying. They thought the Romans maybe around the cross said, he's calling for Elijah, or maybe he's thirsty. And God expects us to address him in our native tongue. And so uh, it is true. In Hebrew, you would say Yahweh, or Jesus, Yeshua. And if you feel strongly about that, I have no burden to change your mind. But I wouldn't go around telling everybody else God's not hearing their prayers if you don't address Him in Hebrew. I think the Lord is the one who confounded the languages at the Tower of Babel, and He expects us to speak to Him in the language that we have from then on. Okay, our next question. If miracles can come from God and Satan, how do we know the difference? That is a good question. Well, obviously, the devil doesn't want you to know the difference, so many of his miracles will closely counterfeit the miracles of God. Does God bring fire down from heaven in the Bible? Mm -hmm. It happened when the temple was consecrated in the days of Moses. It happened when the temple was consecrated in the days of Solomon. When Elijah prayed, fire came down on three occasions actually. When Elijah prayed, did the devil bring fire down in the story of Job? He does. Does the Bible say in the last days the beast will go so far as to bring fire down from God? When Moses threw down his rod and it became a serpent in the book of Exodus, the devil's uh, magicians, did they counterfeit that miracle? So how do you know who's m doing the miracle? You've got to look at the people and the beings behind the miracle and what is the message behind the miracle. Don't go just by miracles because the devil can even counterfeit healings. The devil can give a person the illusion of sickness and take it away and say, voila, they've been healed. And so you need to be very careful. Base your determination on what the messenger is and what the message is, does it follow scripture? That's the only way to really know. Okay, the next question is, 
Is the United States of America mentioned in Bible prophecy? Yes. I'm going to touch on that this morning. And in another presentation, we're going to dedicate completely to showing how the United States in particular uh, is revealed in Bible prophecy. Okay, the next question that we have. If Adam and Eve had not sinned, would Satan still be here free to tempt us to sin? Uh, this is one of those hypothetical questions, you know, the one I often hear that's um, difficult, awkward, is people say, what if after Eve ate the forbidden fruit and she offered it to Adam, he refused? Then what? Would God have given him a new wife? And, uh, <laughs> but this question is a little different. It's saying, what if uh, Adam and Eve never sinned? Would the devil continue to have been able to harass his descendants? I think not. I, th I think that since the Lord gave dominion of this world to Adam and Eve, that as representatives of the world, if they had resisted the devil's temptations, we would have been secure. Because they fell, we being their descendants, we're involved in that. So I know, have you ever thought to yourself, Lord, why couldn't I have been born or created one of these unfallen angels and never had to go through all the misery of this world? You ever wonder that? You know how the children of Israel felt when they were slaves in Egypt? Because of a decision their ancestors made, they found themselves in slavery. And because of a decision our ancestors made, we're in slavery. But God has provided a way of escape. Amen. The next question that we have relates to a study on the Sabbath that you did. Based on Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, why does it really matter what day we set aside to worship the Lord? Yeah, the two principal um, arguments that come from the New Testament when people say we don't really need to keep the Sabbath. One is Romans 14, where Paul says, One man regards one day above another, another man regards every day alike. Let each one be persuaded in his own mind. There in Romans 14, he never even mentions the Sabbath. He's talking about when the Jewish converts to Christianity were urging the Greek and Roman converts to Christianity to keep the Jewish feast days. And he said, you know, if you want to do that, that's up to you. He wasn't talking about one of the Ten Commandments there. Um, and in uh, Colossians 2, this is the other one. It says in particular in verse 13, So let no one judge you in food or drink or in regard of a festival. Again, he's talking about the, the Jewish feasts. Or new moon. Or Sabbaths. He doesn't say Sabbath day. Sabbaths. There were uh, seven annual Jewish Sabbath days that were feast days, they were written on paper, they were not the Ten Commandments. And he proves that in the next verse, verse 17, which are shadows of things to come. Those feast days were shadows. They came after sin to foreshadow the coming of Christ. The seventh day Sabbath came before there was sin. Seventh day of creation for all men. Jesus said it was made for man, it's not for the Jews. It's a whole different category. And uh, you can also read verse 13, it says, these ordinances were nailed to the cross. They were the handwriting of man that were against us. Uh, you don't nail stone to anything. It's talking about the ceremonial Sabbaths. So hopefully that helps a little bit. Okay, our final question for this morning. Uh, where exactly is heaven located? What's the GPS directions for that? It's a little south of Zanzibar. <laughs> um, well, we don't know. Uh, some Christian astronomers have speculated, and again, this is just some speculation, that uh, Orion, the constellation, the nebula Orion, is mentioned three times in the Bible. And uh, there is a black hole in that nebula that is one of the most beautiful things that the um, modern telescopes can look at. It's just corridors of light, it's massive in size, it kind of disappears off into eternity when you look at it. And because Orion's mentioned, um, many have wondered if maybe the dwelling place of God is off in that direction of the cosmos, the universe. Don't know uh, for sure. That's kind of what I think. But uh, looking forward to going and finding out for myself someday. How about you? Amen. Thank you very much for your Bible questions. All right. In order to submit a Bible question, just go to the Landmarks of Prophecy website and you can send in your Bible question. We'll try and answer as many as we can. It is time for special music. Christian Burdell is with us today and he'll be bringing us the music this morning. Amen. Like the woman at the well I was seeking For things that could not satisfy 
I heard my Savior speaking Draw from my well That never shall run dry Fill my cup, Lord I lift it up, Lord Come and quench this thirsting of my soul Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. There are millions in this world who are craving the pleasure earthly things afford. But none can match the wondrous treasure that I Jesus Christ, my Lord, fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord, come and quench this thirsting of my soul, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more, fill my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. So, my children, if the things this world gave you leave hungers that won't pass away, my blessed Lord will come and save you. Thank you very much, Christian and Bertal. Appreciate that. We all want that living water. Amen, friends? Amen. want to welcome you again to this special presentation of the Landmarks of Prophecy. And today we have a study talking about bowing to the beast. And I want to welcome all, also those who are joining us literally around the world. And we know that there are groups in churches that are gathered. And this is Sabbath morning in uh, this hemisphere anyway. And many people have come together in their churches. Some are keeping the Sabbath for the first time. And we just want to welcome you and pray that you get a rich blessing from God. The subject today is a, um, a very serious one. And I just invite you to be praying as I share that uh, it's really God's Spirit that we're going to hear speaking to our hearts. You know, I like to sometimes begin with an amazing fact. And uh, when we speak about the landmarks of prophecy, one of the great landmarks was an ancient wonder of uh, the civilization, of the ancient civilizations. You've heard of the seven wonders of the world. It was called the Colossus of Rhodes. The Colossus of Rhodes was built about 280 BC by the people of Rhodes to celebrate their victory over one of the Greek kings that they had been fighting against. And uh, it was one of the most massive if not the largest of the ancient statues made of bronze glimmered in the sun a hundred feet tall some historians I think it was Herodotus said that uh, ships would sail underneath its legs it straddled the harbor there in Rhodes and it stood for about 60 years and then there was an earthquake and it tumbled and it was never reassembled but for many years it was recognized as one of the wonders of the world but it's not the only great burnished statue that appears in Bible history. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, lesson number 14, dealing with the subject of bowing to the beast. 
And it's based upon a story that we've already touched on beginning in Daniel chapter 2. You remember King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of a giant image. And it wasn't like that uh, Colossus of Rhodes. That was actually dedicated to the sun god Helios. But uh, by the way, whenever you use the word colossal, the word colossal comes from the Colossus of Rhodes. Anything that was just of immense proportions, we talk about it as being colossal. Well, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of a colossal image. Remember the head was of gold. It outlines the history of the world. It gives us those landmarks of prophecy. Silver, Medo-Persia, bronze belly was Greece, the iron legs Rome, feet of iron and clay, the breakup of the Roman Empire. Nebuchadnezzar liked the part of it where it said, you are this head of gold. But he didn't like the other part of the interpretation that said, after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Nebuchadnezzar, we know from bricks that he stamped, said, this is Babylon that I have built, may it last forever. He didn't want another kingdom to displace him. So he came up with an idea. He thought, if that great image, that great statue that I've dreamed of represents the kingdoms of the world, if the top being gold represents Babylon, what if I make what I saw in that dream except make it all gold? And I'll tell the whole world, this is going to be the God that we worship. Babylon will last forever. He thought he could somehow change the dream by doing this. A very driven king. So that's just what he did. He made a, an image of gold and it was probably the biggest one that's ever been made in history. 90 feet tall. And actually it tells us, we get it in uh, the Hebrew measurements, it's 60 cubits by 6 cubits. Now you know in the Bible when it, it doesn't give the depth, that's because if it gives the width, the depth will be the same. Notice, 60 cubits by 6 cubits, and then it's understood by 6 cubits. It's like the New Jerusalem, the length, the breadth, and the height of it are the same. And so many scholars believe that this thing was 60 by 6 by 6. Does that sound familiar? And then he tells everybody, gathers the who's who in his empire, and they all come to the plains of Dur, and he's got the whole massive orchestra there, and he waits till the right moment as the sun is coming up, and it's covered with a sheet, and tells everybody that when we unveil this statue, and you hear the music, everybody must bow down and worship. We're going to unite the empire of Babylon through common worship. Is the beast power going to try that in the last days? And so he gives the signal, the music plays, and everybody bows down. Now there was a little uh, encouragement. He said, and if you don't bow down, see that furnace we used over there to forge this image? It's still got coals in it. We'll fire that up and you're going to get thrown in the furnace if you do not bow down and worship my image. So there's a death decree if you do not worship. Does that sound like Revelation? And whoso falls not down and worships the same hour will be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So they played the music and almost everybody bowed down. Except there were three Hebrews. Nebuchadnezzar knew who they were. He respected them. Three of his counselors. Their names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Hebrew names. Babylonian names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they could not bow down. Why not? One of the Ten Commandments says you will not make a graven image and bow down to it. It's very clear. And they said, we have to choose. Do we obey God or do we obey man? And they might have argued within themselves and said, you know, the king's been good to us. And he's given us good positions and raises and just out of gratitude one time we ought to bow down. Just once. And if not that, you know, maybe we should at least stoop down and, and tie our sandals so we don't look like we're trying to wreck his whole party. Just compromise a little bit. We'll be praying to God in our hearts, but we'll just bow down when everyone else does. I mean, they could have rationalized a thousand ways, but they would not compromise, and they stood tall. The Lord accomplished through those three young men that day on the plains of Dura what he had been wanting to do through the Hebrew nation for hundreds of years. He had them stand up for him among the pagans and glorify God. Nebuchadnezzar was outraged. 
He said, did I get it right that you wouldn't bow down? I'll tell you what, I'll give you another chance. You, maybe you didn't hear it. I don't want to lose you guys. When I play the music, we'll play it one more time. You bow down or you're going to the fiery furnace. And who's going to, what God is it that's going to save you? He knew they worshiped Jehovah. What God is going to save you from my hand? One of them answered and said, we're not going to bow down. You don't need to play the music again. And if our God wants who we serve, he can deliver us from your hand, O king. I have a friend who uh, struggled with terminal cancer. He said, Doug, I prayed about it, but I found peace in the words of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, I know God can heal me, but even if he doesn't heal me, I'm going to serve him. And that was the attitude of these young men. But be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image that, you do, that thou hast set up. We need that kind of resolve if we're going to survive the last days because the same kind of test is going to come to God's people regarding the law of God and who we worship. And we need to make sure we're not bowing to Babylon in the last days. Nebuchadnezzar was in a rage and in his fury, even as much as he loved these young men, he said, how dare you talk to me like that? I'm the king. This is a government law. He had them all tied up just as they were in their robes, strongest men in the kingdom, charged to the mouth of this furnace that was heated up seven times hotter than it should have been heated. The waves of heat were just wafting out. And even the soldiers that threw them in, it was so hot and the king's command so urgent that as they got near enough to toss them in, they were scorched to death and dropped dead on the spot. You got to think about that for a second. Suppose that you're one of the teams of soldiers that had to grab one of those three Hebrews. And you see that when the first two soldiers run to the mouth and they throw in Shadrach, they drop dead. And the king said, next, you've got to now know that in order to get him in, to fulfill the king's law, you may die. They were willing to die for the king of Babylon doing the wrong thing. A lot of people in the world are willing to die suicide missions believing the wrong thing. Am I right? Isn't that... So just because you're willing to die for your belief doesn't make it truth. All three of them were thrown in the furnace. And then Nebuchadnezzar said, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And his advisor said, That's true, O king. The king peering off into the furnace, he said, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. You may go through fiery trials when you stand up for Jesus, but the good news is you don't go alone. Just like God sent his angel to Daniel in the lion's den, Jesus will come to you during your time of trial. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Amen? Amen. Now, that same test is something we're going to face in the last days. If you have your Bibles, I thought as an introduction to this, probably be a good idea to go to Revelation 13. Let the Bible speak for itself. I'm going to read the first few verses here, give us context, and you tell me if it doesn't sound similar to Daniel chapter 3. Revelation 13 verse 1, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. You know, in Daniel it talks about ten horns. And having seven uh, heads and ten horns, and on his ten horns, there were crowns and blasphemous names. Now the beast I saw was like a leopard. There's a leopard in Daniel. And his feet were like the feet of a bear. There's a bear in Daniel. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Again, Daniel 7. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded. And its deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered or marveled and followed the beast. And they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, Who is like the beast and who is able to make war with him? And it was given him a mouth speaking great things. Daniel talks about this beast power speaking great things. Pompous words. And blasphemy was given him. And uh, I'm sorry, and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue 42 months. Same time period you find in the book of Daniel. That's 1,260 days or three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those that dwell in heaven. He's speaking against the truth of God. 
And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. It's a persecuting power. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. It's an international power. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. It's a religious power. Whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is obviously in opposition to those who serve God. And anyone who has an ear, let him hear. He that leads into captivity will go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience of the saints. Now, we all hear about the mark of the beast, right? Revelation 13, there are two beasts. Notice, verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. First one comes up out of the sea. This beast comes up out of the earth. And he has two horns like a lamb. Lamb's a good thing, but he speaks like a dragon. Dragon's a bad thing. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship. The second beast is powerful enough to force the rest of the world to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he performs great signs so that he's even able to make fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he's granted to do in the sight of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword, sword is the word of God, and who lived. And he was granted to give power and breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Again, death decree if you don't worship. Sound familiar? And he causes all, this is universal, both small and great, rich and poor, slave and free, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads, that no one might buy or sell except the one that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. You say, now if you're smart, you'll be able to spot what this power is. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Okay, with that as a background, let me tell you what I'm going to say, then I'll tell you, then I'll tell you what I said. These two beasts, first let me ask you a question. There's a verse in the Bible that says, Am I your enemy if I tell you the truth? Now I'm asking you. Are you going to be mad at me if I tell you the truth? Uh, some medicine is hard to take. And this is, this is a tough subject, but I need to be honest with you and tell you what the Bible says. You want to hear the truth. These two beasts represent the powers of the Roman Catholic Church based in Europe and the United States and Protestants based in North America. Now, that covered just about everybody in the room and everybody watching. <laughs> Not everybody, but many. I'm a Protestant. I live in the U.S. I'm a loyal American. I believe the first beast is talking about the Roman Catholic Church. Second beast in verse 11 is speaking of the United States. We have a whole other study on the second beast that's coming. Right now, I want to use the Bible and see if what I'm sharing with you is accurate about the first beast. Now, when you say a beast in the Bible, well, actually, well, that'll be in the lesson. I'll just hold that thought and we'll get to it when I get to it. Question number one. How does our story in Daniel relate to Revelation? We already saw this. Revelation chapter 13, verse 15. As many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. It's easy to say, oh, I'd give my life for Jesus, but when you're really brought to the spot, could you do it? It's so easy for us to rationalize and postpone and say, I, I can't do it today. I'll just worship the beast a little bit, but I'll, I'll change my mind later. And we've got to know ahead of time what the beast is and that we're not going to compromise our convictions. It's a death decree. It doesn't get any more serious than that. Number two. Now, what are the three angels' messages in Revelation 14? First of all, what chapter did I just read to you out of the Bible? Chapter 13. The next chapter tells about messages that go to the world before Jesus comes. Because in chapter 14, Jesus comes. He, there's at least one image of Jesus coming there. Let's look at these messages. It talks about three angels give messages to the world, and they summarize a message that's to go to the world just before Jesus comes. Very quickly, in Revelation 14, verse 7, there's angel comes down from heaven. He says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His 
judgment will come or is come. Is come. This is a message that comes to the world in the last stage of the world's history. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, if you were here you caught it, I said the church history is divided up in several, several parts. The last phase of church history is the church of Laodicea. We're living in that phase of church history now. It's when people think they're rich and increased with goods, but they don't know that they're poor and wretched, miserable, blind and naked. Churches, do you know there are more people in the world now that are dying from overeating than undereating? First time in history? Diabetes, you can ask Dr. DeRose more about that. Think we're rich and increased with goods? Don't know what our real spiritual condition is? The word Laodicea means a judging of the people. So this is a message that goes out during this last phase. Christ has entered the heavenly sanctuary for his last phase of his priestly ministry as our high priest. And the message that goes is the hour of his judgment is come. We all agree when Jesus comes he's giving rewards, right? Some are caught up, they're saved. Some are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Makes sense some form of judgment happens before he comes. Is that right? The Bible says judgment must begin at the house of God. Peter says that. It's also in Ezekiel 9. There's a judgment that's actually going on now. Doesn't that kind of sober you up a little bit? The hour of His judgment has come. And these angels go on to say, Worship Him because we're in this time of judgment. Return to the worship of the true God. Worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. Now you know where you find that phrase in the Old Testament? Most of Revelation can be found in other places in the Bible. That comes from the fourth commandment. You can see it there in Exodus 20. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This is a commandment that has largely been forgotten or at least neglected by many Christians. And it may be the point of controversy in the last days. Just like you find in... Daniel chapter 3, the government makes a law that says you need to break the second commandment about idolatry. And you've got to decide, do I worship God or do I break the second commandment? Daniel chapter 6, the king makes a law that says everybody must worship Darius instead of God. Daniel has to decide, do I keep the first commandment or do I obey, obey the government law? In the last days, the devil's going to take one of God's commandments. I believe it's the fourth commandment. And he's going to say, don't worry about that, even though we know what the Bible says. And tell us to change it. We're going to have to choose between obeying God and obeying men. It has to do with worship. It says the beast power will think to change times and laws. Only one commandment is both a time and a law. Revelation 14, continuing on with the second angel's message. There followed another angel saying, what is it? Babylon is fallen. Not will fall, it's happening now fall in that great city. Why? Because she, what does a woman represent in Bible analogy? So if Babylon is a woman, is it a true church or a false or counterfeit? Or compromised at least church? Because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then you come to one of the most fearful messages in the whole New Testament. Revelation 14, speaking of the third angel's message, if any man worships the beast and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or his hand, the same will drink the wine of the wrath of God. So these messages warning us about we're in a time of judgment. We must return to worshiping the true God. Do not worship the beast. Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people. You see, God has his people right now in many different churches and religions around the world. There, you've heard me say this from the start. My belief is, and you know, I've shared with you, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. My belief is the majority of true Christians are not in my denomination. Do you hear that? I just want to go on record. I believe God has His children in many different churches. But there's going to be a shaking before Jesus comes back. And God is going to bring people together. There's only going to be two groups. Do we agree? One's going to get the mark of the beast and one is going to have the seal of God. There is going to be a revival among genuine Christians scattered around the world and a desire to return to biblical Christianity. 
Jesus said, all men will know you are my children by your love for one another, but the devil has brought all kinds of confusion. That's what Babylon is about. The Tower of Babel was confusion. Religious confusion has permeated the churches. All these different doctrines that divide us, we're going to come back on biblical unity based on truth. And this is a message going to the world. After these three messages are given in Revelation 14, next thing that happens, Jesus comes. And so we're seeing this fulfilled in your ears right now. These messages are going to the world. Christ is coming soon. Number three. Now, what does a beast represent in Bible prophecies? Whenever I say, don't be angry friends, but the U.S. is a beast, people think it's an insult. Well, it could be. But biblically, they use beasts to identify nations. You look in Daniel 7 verse 17. These great, what? Beasts, which are four, are four what? Four monsters. No, kingdoms. So when I say that the Catholic Church and the United States are beasts, we're not calling them monsters. We're saying they are powers. They are political, religious powers. This is what the Bible says. They were kings or kingdoms. Another verse here. Daniel 7, 23. The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So when we say Mark of the Beast, most of us are picturing some diabolical looking horned hoofed monster. And when you say the U.S. is one of these beasts in prophecy, people think you're being unpatriotic. Or when you say the Catholic Church, it, it means that you're speaking against Catholics. I love American people. I'm an American. I am not transferring my citizenship. You all hear me? I went to Catholic school. I have a lot of Catholic friends. I love them. But you ought to just use common sense. What is the largest Christian church in the world? The Roman Catholic Church. Does it surprise you that it would appear in prophecy? Did Jesus have people in the Old Testament that were his children? Were the Jews his people? Did they mess up? Did he call them on the carpet and point out their sins? Did he send prophets to tell them and rebuke them for their hypocrisy? Did they do things wrong? Did they persecute the prophets? Were they his people? Yeah, but he told them straight. So no question God has his people in the Protestant churches of North America, in the Roman Catholic and the Orthodox churches, but there's some very strong messages about coming back to truth and God does not like it when the truth is distorted and that's what's happened. So you follow me and see if it makes sense. Uh, one more proof. You read in Daniel 8, it says, The ram that you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. These beasts representing kingdoms. Daniel 8, 21, the rough goat is the king of Grecia. That was Alexander the Great. All right, number four. So we know what a beast is now. When I talk to you about the eagle, what country is often symbolized by the eagle? The United States. And when we say, oh, the bear is having problems with the eagle, who am I talking about? And the lion. Well, several countries claim the lion, but Great Britain is... And when you say the dragon, you think China. Right? That's what they use. And so we even do that today where we use beasts kind of as a national representation. Did you know Benjamin Franklin wanted the national animal for America to be the turkey? How many of you know that? It's true, yeah. I'm glad he lost that one. All right, Revelation 13, 1. Now, with that as a background, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a what? A beast rise up out of the sea. Make a note, C, because that comes up later. What does the ocean represent? Having, it goes on to say, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his ha heads the names of blasphemy. When the Roman power crumbled, in the place of the Roman power we saw that there were ten divisions that came up. Remember the image had ten toes. And so this represents the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. But it goes on and it, it does some interesting things here. Now the beast that I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth was like the mouth of a lion. Those are three animals in particular that you find in Daniel chapter 7. It's interesting though. In Daniel 7 it says lion, bear, leopard. In Revelation it says it backwards. It says it leopard, um, bear, lion. Why? Because in where John was standing, looking back, 
he's seen it in the opposite direction of history. It's exactly reversed than from when Daniel did it. He was looking forward to these things. So it's perfectly sequenced the way the prophets looked at them. And so those kingdoms represented, of course, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and that fourth creature with the iron teeth represented the iron kingdom of Rome. So we're going to look at a number of criteria and quickly identify what is this beast that's being identified. And I told you already, I believe it points to the Roman Catholic power, Roman Catholic Church. Um, several criteria, I think we've got about nine here. Look at the little key indicators. It says it rises one from the sea. It gets its power and seat from the dragon. A worldwide power. It's guilty of blasphemy. It rules for 42 months. It has a deadly wound that heals. It persecutes God's saints and is connected with a mysterious number 666. All right, going where well, that is what our goal is. Let's look and see if it matches up to the evidence that is given in prophecy. Number five, this beast arises from the sea. What does sea or water symbolize biblically? You can look in Revelation 17. The angel tells John what the waters represent. He said, the what? The waters which thou sawest are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Meaning, this power is rising up from a densely populated center of civilization. Where did the Roman church rise up from? Rome. What was the center of civilization back during that day? Who was it that imprisoned John when he had his vision? Rome. Have you heard the expression, all roads lead to Minneapolis? No, that's not how it goes. They all lead to Rome. And be, so it was the center, and it's talking about of many peoples, many nations. And that's why Paul wanted to go preach in Rome. He ended up dying there, as did Peter. They wanted to go and get the gospel at this fountain of civilization. So that's where it would rise up from. Number six, who gives the beast his power and his position? Revelation 13, 2, and the, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, the dragon, we know who is behind the dragon is principally devil. But in particular in Revelation 12, it's also talking about the Roman Empire ruled by the Caesars or pagan Rome. Um, when you look in Revelation 12, and we have another study that's going to go into that, it talks about this beast power, the dragon, trying to kill all the male children in Bethlehem. That's in Revelation 12. What power is it that tried to kill all the baby boys? It was Rome. Rome, you got two Romes in prophecy here. You got Rome that is iron, then you have Rome that is iron and clay. One is political military, the other is political military religious. Man is made out of clay. You got one Rome led by Caesars, but then as the Caesars began to decline in their place, the church became legal, and now you have Rome led by the church. Right? And so this is all it's saying is the dragon, meaning pagan Rome, ruled by Caesars, gave his seat, handed over the seat, same kingdom, same city, same palace, to the church of Rome and his authority. We'll show you that from history as we proceed here. All right, so we see one clue. The dragon, or pa pagan Rome, gave his power, seat, and authority to papal Rome, led by the popes. Now, just reviewing something, how many of you just remember from your um, elementary history, there was a time when Christians were fed to the lions in Rome? Many of us remember that, okay? I mean, you personally weren't there, but you remember reading about that. But then all of a sudden, headquarters for the church is in Rome. Something changed. There was a period of time when the Christians were persecuted. They had to build catacombs. They went underground. It was against the law to be a Christian. All of a sudden, they're the national church. Something radically changed. Well, for several hundred years, up until about 300 AD, Christianity was called religio illicite, meaning forbidden religion. And they were persecuted. They went underground. They died for their faith by the thousands, hundreds of thousands. But then Rome began to have a lot of wars, a lot of internal fighting. Along came an emperor by the name of Constantine the Great. His mother ostensibly claimed to convert to Christianity. 
he realized Christians are not as bad as Nero. Nero blamed them for burning Rome. They, they said the Christians were cannibals. You know why? Because they heard about them saying, we're eating the flesh and drinking the blood during the Lord's Supper, not believing they were symbols. They thought they were having these cannibalistic feats in these secret catacombs. And so there was a lot of hatred for Christians back then. Um, they also had a lot of hatred for Jews because the Jews had rebelled against the Roman Empire. That's why they sent the Romans down there. They rebelled at Masada. And so Christians wanted to distance themselves from the Jews, for one thing. Constantine realized that Christians, they're not really any threat. He legalized Christianity. Matter of fact, he claimed he had a vision when he was fighting a battle at the bridge with Maximilian. He saw a cross in the sky. He said God told him to conquer under the sign of the cross. He won the battle. He said that's a sign the whole nation should convert to Christianity. Matter of fact, to prove how sincere he was, he ordered his army to march through the Tiber River. He said, you've been baptized now. You're all Christians. Well, you know, they went into the water, dry pagans, and they came up wet pagans. They didn't know anything about what it meant to be a Christian. We talked about, you know, like I was baptized the first time and got drunk that night. I had no idea what was involved. And so these pagans that were told, now you're Christians, they brought all their pagan beliefs into the church. One commentator from history, this is Abbott's Roman History. He said, the transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople, Constantinople named after Constantine, was a sad blow to the prestige of Rome. And at the time, one might have predicted her speedy decline. But when the emperor Justinian transferred headquarters from Rome to Constantinople, you would have thought the city of Rome is no longer the capital. It's just going to fall apart. But historians tell us the development of the church and the growing authority of the Bishop of Rome or the Pope gave her, Rome, a new lease on life and made her again the capital of the religious, the capital of the world this time, the religious capital of the civilized world. And we know from history that's exactly what happened. That's why it's not just called the Christian Church or even the Catholic Church, but it's called the Roman Catholic Church. How did the headquarters of Christianity move from Jerusalem to Rome? Where was that authorized? You read in the Bible, they had their councils in Jerusalem. You remember reading that in Acts chapter 15 and other places? But what happened is the Emperor Justinian, oh, first of all, Constantine legalized Christianity. Let me just back up there. And uh, they, they, the priests, the people came running to the priests and said, we have idols and images everywhere. What do we do with them? And they said, well, you better give them Christian names because the Greeks and the Romans had hundreds of gods. And even Paul talks about this. He said, you've got so many gods, you've made a statue to an unknown god. And they said, what do we call our gods? We've got these gods of Venus and, and, and uh, Jupiter and Apollos and Mars. And they said, well, call them Mary, Peter, James, and John. Even though the Bible says, do not pray to statues, all of a sudden, almost overnight, Christians began to engage in idolatry because it was so pervasive in the Greco-Roman Empire. And a lot of habits that you find nowhere in the Bible that really found their roots in paganism. We studied about hell, Greek mythology, Pluto being in charge of hell. That came during this time. A lot of false teachings came in with the great pagan influx into the Christian church that was based in Rome. Then when Justinian, the Roman emperor, said, I'm moving the capital to Constantinople, he told the bishop of Rome, and this is in 528, or 538, sorry. He said, uh, I'm giving you an army, you're in charge. And that suddenly turned the church into not only a religious power, but a religious political power. In the history of you from the University of Rome, it says, to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the Pontus, or the popes, in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. And so there was a transfer of authority. Didn't we just read that? It says in the Bible, he will give him his seat the dragon gave him his seat, power, and great authority. That's that dragon power of Rome that killed Jesus, that drove the nails in his hands. The beast receives his power, seat, and authority from Rome exactly as we said it would happen. Number seven. <clears throat> How far-reaching is the influence of the beast? Well, it says he causes all. Revelation 13.3 He makes all the world to worship and all the world wonders after the beast. It is a universal power. It tells us in Revelation 13, 7, an authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. It's a global power. 
Do you know what the word Catholic means? It means universal. Does anyone here not know that the Roman Catholic Church is a universal, not a church only, but a power? Would the leader of the Baptist Church be able to have the um, United Nations assemble for him to address them? Or the leader of the Methodist Church? Even the Greek Orthodox Church cannot have the United Nations assemble. But are you aware that the Vatican is not only a religion, the Vatican is the smallest country in the world. It has ambassadors, it has its own money, has its own railroad. It's very small. It has its own postal system. Its own guard, Swiss guard. It is an independent country. Do you know the Vatican is the most, foot by foot, I think it's the most populated country in the world. Just like 103 acres, whatever it is. They got about a thousand people there. But it's an independent country and it's a church. Number eight, what comes out of the mouth of the beast? Now, I tell, this is where it gets a little serious, friends, but we got to be honest. Revelation 13, verse 6, it says he opens his mouth in, what's that word, blasphemy, against God to blaspheme his name. Now, you can also read about the beast power in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. It says he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Blasphemy means when a person puts themselves in the position of God. Now just in case you don't believe my definition, this is the biblical definition. If you look in John 10, 33, it says that the Jews were preparing to stone Jesus. And they said, they answered and said, for a good work we do not stone you, but for what? For blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. All right, biblical definition of blasphemy is when a man puts himself in the position of God. The Jews knew that you're not supposed to receive worship. It's in the Bible. Some of you remember when King Herod, Acts chapter 12, he let the people worship him and said it's the voice of a God, and he should have said don't do that, and an angel of the Lord struck him and he died. You remember if you read your Bible when the people of, I think it was Philippi, tried to worship Paul and Silas and make offerings to him. Paul and Silas tore their clothes and said, don't do that. That's blasphemy. We're just men. People should not be worshipped as gods. That makes another god. That's why Daniel would not pray to Darius. But does the Catholic Church put itself in a position of making a man more than just a man? This is a quote from Pope Leo XIII. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. That's actually a painting of him as well. I've got a few other quotes here, and I've got to pace myself so that we don't run out of time. Here's another one. The Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man, but of God. He is likewise the divine... This is from the Catholic Church, their own official writings and, and conferences. He is likewise the divine monarch and the supreme emperor and king of kings. The Pope is, as it were, God on earth, sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief king of kings, having a plenitude of power to whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent God direction not only of earthly but also the heavenly kingdom. I got a whole list of, um, and these are from, it was Pope Leo the Thirteenth encyclical letter. Um, Hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as the king of heaven, king of earth, and of the lower regions. We define the Apostolic Holy See, the Vatican, and the Roman Pontiff to hold primacy over the whole world. That's from the decree of the Council of Trent. And these things, you can all find them easy enough online. Uh, some of them are in your lesson. But they do officially claim that the Pope is not a mere man, but he holds the position of God. That's one of his titles. Another definition for blasphemy. <clears throat> now keep in mind, I'm not trying to say anything negative about Pope Francis. I'd like to meet him. He seems like such a nice guy. He reminds me of my grandfather. Seems so approachable and sincere. I'm, I'm not talking about the person. I'm talking about the office. Is that clear to everybody? I'm not talking about Catholic people. I'm not talking about the Pope. Any, I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about organization, structure, teachings. That's all we're talking about. Another definition for blasphemy. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this that speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So for a man 
to claim the ability to forgive sins is blasphemy. Did Jesus say he could forgive sin? He did. What right did he have to do that? He is the Son of God. Now he told the woman, maybe it was Mary Magdalene, go and sin no more. He was going to forgive her. Told the man, let down through the roof. Your sins are forgiven. They said, that's blasphemy. And they were right, if he wasn't the Son of God. But when a man says, I have the authority to decide whose sins I'm going to forgive, that's defined as blasphemy. Now, here's from the book on Dignities and Duties of the Priests, volume 12. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon as they either refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest proceeds and God subscribes to it. It's saying the man, the church, decides who is forgiven. Where in the Bible does it say you have to confess your sins to a priest in order to be forgiven? The Bible says you confess your sins to God. You confess your faults to one another. Number nine, how long would this first beast power, talking about Revelation 13, 1, the first beast now, how long would it be its primary rule? It gives us a time period. Time period is given three times in Revelation, so you don't miss it. And power was given unto him to continue, how long? Forty and two months. Forty-two months, the Jewish year had 360 days, lunar calendar. Forty-two months was three and a half years, 1,260 days. Same time period that there was a famine in the days of Elijah. Same time period that Jesus preached and was persecuted. It represents a time of persecution. Elijah fled for his life during three and a half years. Jesus was dogged and persecuted three and a half years. And there are 1,260 prophetic years where the true church kind of has to go underground because a political religious institution, the iron mixed with clay, is in power during that time. The legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 538. This is a very well established date in history. When there went into effect a decree of Emperor Justinian making the Bishop of Rome the head over all the churches, definer of doctrine, corrector of heretics, and he was given an army to force people to believe. Now did Jesus use an army to get believers? So it started to kill people that didn't believe what the church taught. Church, Christian church was never told to do that. And then you can read, Vigilus ascended the papal chair in 538 under the middle, military protection of Belisarius. That's History of the Christian Church, Volume 3. What happened to the beast after the 42 months? You can read in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3, I saw one of his heads as it was wounded to death, and the deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. Well, if you start with 42 months, a day in a Bible prophecy is how long? I've appointed you a day for a year. 42 months has 1,260 days, but that would really mean 1,260 years. If you start in 538 and you go 1,260 years, that comes to 1798. And so what happened in 1798? Do you realize that from 538 until 1798, the Roman Church had virtually uninterrupted power over Europe? You had the Holy Roman Empire. Any of you ever play chess? On the right of the queen and the king, what are the pieces? Bishop. There's one king, one queen, two bishops. Because that modeled what was going on throughout Europe during that time. All the monarchs really had ambassadors from the church they had to answer to. And if the Pope said, You've got to follow what I'm saying. You've got to pay the taxes, the offerings that I'm saying. If they didn't, the Pope would declare the whole country would be excommunicated. They could not get to heaven without the priests. And so they really held everyone in terror. They could be consigned to purgatory or hell. And so even the kings cowered in fear. Henry VIII was one of the first ones that stood up. It was for all the wrong reasons. It was because the Pope wouldn't grant him his 50th divorce, or whatever it was. I forget which one it was. So he finally broke away and said, Well, I'll start my own church. That's how you get the Church of England. There's more to the story, I'll tell you another time. But in 1798, following the wars of Napoleon, Napoleon sent his general Berthier into Rome. He um, abolished the papal government and he established a secular one. At that time, the Roman Church received a deadly wound. They lost their sway over Europe and they remained out of power. You can read in Revelation 13, we just read it. He that leads into captivity will go into captivity. He that kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. 
And many of the church leaders were slain during that time. The Pope himself was carried off into captivity in Valence uh, where he died. Now it stayed that way. It looked like the church had lost its sway over Europe. But the deadly wound was healed. Here's actually a copy of the newspaper from 1929. And this is the San Francisco Chronicle. When the Pope was once again reinstated as an independent country, it says the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past and the Vatican was at peace. In affixing autographs to the memorable document, healing the wound. Isn't that interesting language? Didn't we find that? The deadly wound was healed. Healing the wound that had gone on since 1798. There was great cordiality displayed by both parties. This established, and Mussolini was instrumental in that. You've heard of him. This established the Vatican once again as an independent country that had ambassadors going not now just to the leaders of Europe, but to the whole world. Do you know that uh, even in North America, U.S. has an ambassador to the Vatican. They don't have an ambassador to our church. What does that mean? That's a lot of power. You know, it tells us his deadly wound would be healed and all the world wondered. Matter of fact, Pope Francis in particular is a very unique man. He's the first Jesuit pope. And to have one pope resign, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. And then to have another pope who comes from obscurity from another country, um, from another continent, who has gone to such international prominence, he's in the headlines every single week. And it's usually some kind of earth-shaking news. The papacy has definitely gained worldwide influence, prestige, and prominence. Well, it seems like a lovely man. I'm not talking about the person. It just seems so kind and, and approachable and, and uh, down to earth. But what we're dealing with is the teachings. The official teachings have not changed. You know, the church, they basically claim infallibility. I can show you that in black and white. They claim to have the ability to forgive sins. Number 11. Is the beast a government or a religious power? Now, the earlier beasts that we read about in Daniel and Revelation, they're mostly governments. But it says this one, there's something religious about it. Revelation 13, 15. He causes all that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So there's worship involved there. It's religious. We all agreed? You're awful quiet. It makes me nervous. <clears throat> Number 12. What does the beast do to the saints? It tells us in addition that it is a persecuting power. Revelation 13 verse 7. And it says, And it was given unto him to make what? War with the saints and to overcome them. Now, the Roman Catholic Church freely admits that they were involved in persecution. Pope John Paul II was brave enough to actually ask in behalf of the church forgiveness for the many millions who were killed by the church. And I've been around Europe. You can go and see the, the torture chambers. Matter of fact, in the churches, they'll take you on tours. And they'll show you the places where the Inquisition was enacted and people were imprisoned for not believing. If they were heretics they could be killed, they could be burnt at the stake. Literally millions of Christians and Jews or anyone who was classified as a heretic was killed by the church. They were definitely in the category of a persecuting power. They admitted. Matter of fact one British historian, Edward Leakey, writes this, that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. That's history of the rise of the spirit of rationalization in Europe. <clears throat> Excuse me. And as I said, you can go through Europe and they'll show you the masks, they'll show you the dungeons, they'll show you the rack, they'll show you all the different implements. And you can just pay a little tour fee and they're under the churches. So no one questions. It was a definitely a persecuting power. Number 13. <clears throat> What is the mysterious number that identifies the beast? This is where it gets very interesting. Now we're getting to the end of Revelation 13, 18. It says his number is what? 600, three score, and six. Just a couple of weeks ago I pulled up behind a car and there it was on the license plate. 666. Actually I have a friend in the office. I was uh, getting change at the store one time and my change came back. Six dollars and sixty-six cents. And I said, ooh, look at that, six, six, six. And she said, ooh, yeah. I said, 
Do you know what that means? She said, no, but it's bad. That's all, that's all she knew. People know the number. Oh. Now if you happen to be at an auditorium and you know you got the seats and the seats are numbered and it says you got seat 665 and you got seat 666, it doesn't mean anything. I'll give you some amazing facts tonight on the number 666 that uh, you'll find very interesting. But stay with me. The official title for the Pope, it says it's the number of a man. It means a figurehead. Not any one particular Pope, but it's a position. It's an office. This is from Pope John Paul's book called Crossing the Threshold of Hope. Confronted with the Pope, one must make a choice. The leader of the Catholic Church is defined by the faith as the Vicar of Jesus Christ. That title, Vicar of Jesus Christ, in Latin is Vicarious Philae Dei. That's the position that he, that's his official title. And is accepted as such by believers, the Pope is considered the man who on earth represents the Son of God who takes the place of the second person of the omnipotent God of the Trinity. Kind of frightens me for any man to say, I take the place of Jesus on earth. But that's their teaching. Now, here's a quote from a, a document that actually, actually has mysteriously gone missing. Um, from the Sunday Visitor. What are the letters on the Pope's crown and what do they signify? And it says, and this was from April 18, 1915, the letters on the Pope's crown are these, Vicarious Philae Dei, which is Latin for Vicar of the Son of God. Now, there's a, a lot of websites you can go to that have official documents. The Vatican has their own library. Pope Paul, um, the, not John Paul II, I think it was Pope Paul the 23rd, the one who was in the last century. He several times used that title, Vicarious Philae Dei, in his documents. When you take that Latin title, and you convert it to using Roman numerals to uh, their number equivalent. You know, in English our, our letters don't have numerical value. But the Roman letter V represents what? How many of you remember your Roman numerals? I is? X is? 10. C? 100, like century. Right? M is millennium or a thousand. So you take the Roman numerals, you take the title of the Pope, Vicarious Philae Dei, and you add that up, and what does it come to? 666. It's the number of a man. His own title. Throughout Revelation, that number 7 represents perfection or completeness. The number 6 represents imperfection. It's the basis for the Babylonian system of calculation. If you play roulette, there are 36 slots on the wheel, 360 degrees in a circle. Do you know if you add up all of the numbers, 1 through 36, 1 plus 2, plus 3, plus 4, you go up to 36, it adds up to 666. Isn't that interesting? I don't know what it means, but it's interesting. Don't play roulette is what that means. <clears throat> a triple six, therefore, symbolizes a triple union of air, the union of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Number 14. Who will sing God's praises in heaven? And you can read in Revelation 15 verse 2. It says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. You know, friends, I, I just need to summarize this, and I may not be able to say everything I'd like to say. And there's some information you may not see in your lesson that is on the screen. I'll explain that later, so don't worry. I'm going to pray as I share this with you. And if we don't get to the closing song, I apologize, Christian. I, I just, this is really important. The Bible is what we need to go by. Amen? The Bible says that we're not bow down to statues. Right? Catholic Church says that we can bow down and should to statues. The Bible teaches all have sinned except Jesus. Right? The Roman Catholic Church says Mary was sinless. The Bible teaches that Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy 2.5 The Roman Church says Mary is a co-mediator. The Bible teaches that Christ offered His sacrifice on the cross once for all. The Catholic Church teaches the priest sacrifices Christ on the altar at every Mass. The Bible teaches that all Christians are saints and priests. The Catholic Church teaches that saints and priests are a special class within the Christian community. The Bible teaches that all Christians should know that they have eternal life. Catholic Church teaches that Christians cannot and should not know that they have eternal life. 
The Bible teaches that we should call no religious leader father. Matthew 23, 9. You know, Jesus said, call no man father. You have one father which is in heaven. Of course, the Catholic Church tells us to call priests and the Pope father. The Bible teaches us not to pray in vain repetition. It's the words of Jesus. Catholic Church says to say, Our Father, Hail Mary, over and over again, as though God is reached by repetitive prayers. The Bible teaches to confess your sins to God only. Catholic Church says you must confess your sins to the priest for forgiveness. The Bible teaches before baptism, a person should be taught the gospel and the commandments of God, believe and repent. But in the Catholic Church, they teach that uh, infants must be baptized before they know that. The teaching of purgatory, limbo, prayers for the dead are nowhere in scriptures but the relics of paganism that found their way into Christianity. And before Jesus comes, he is calling his people out of Babylon. There are good, loving, spirit-filled people in many different churches who have been confused by unbiblical teachings and God is wanting people to return to biblical truth. Now I know some of the things I shared, are we still friends? Yes. I'm, again, I love people in all different churches, but I think our loyalty must be to the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. And if you would like to say, Lord, some of these things are difficult, but I want to follow Christ in His Word, that is the only rock that will survive the coming storm, is the Word of God. If that's your desire, would you lift your hands before Him? I'd like to invite Christian to come out. And he's going to sing as we go off the air. And uh, we'll all be praying together that God will open our eyes and help us to see what he has prepared for us, to help us to see and to recognize the truth. Is that your desire? Amen. Open my eyes that I may see Glimpses of truth thou hast for me, place in me.